Welcome back, everyone, to our Sunday School series. We are in our unit entitled Dealing with Temptation. And today's lesson is entitled Temptation to Rely on Myself Instead of God. The point of the lesson is this. God's provision is always better than what we try to get for ourselves. Matthew chapter 4 is the account of Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness following his baptism. It is there that he was tempted by the devil over the course of 40 days. The three temptations that he faces for Jesus to do something outside the scope of God's will, which of course is what temptation and sin always want us to do. Today's lesson is going to deal with the first of those three temptations that he faced. So let us pray as we begin today's lesson. Heavenly Father, precious, wonderful Lord our God, thank you so much, Lord, for loving us, blessing us. Thank you, Lord, that even though we're sinners, you sent your son Jesus to die for us. Jesus, who was perfect without sin and became our sacrificial lamb, Thank you, Lord, for loving us and blessing us so much. Lord, help us as we learn and study, receive your word today. Help us to be challenged and changed and encouraged by it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verses 1 through 4, as we said, are an account when Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, as we will see in verse 1. So, let's begin. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. <clears throat> as always, Jesus serves as our example, a perfect example. Here, he is our example in the face of temptation, as he demonstrated a pattern that we can follow to resist the devil. He also showed us we have a Savior who is our great high priest, tempted as we are, but able to resist, thus able to offer us help when we find ourselves being tempted. The Bible tells us that he was tempted in every way, just as you and I are, but he was without sin. The use of the word then, as it began, then Jesus was led, that links the passage to the previous discussion, which happened to be the baptism of of Jesus. God ordained the sequence of the temptations, but he did not directly cause them. Remember, we saw in the previous lesson that God cannot be tempted and he never tempts anyone with evil. God is never responsible for tempting anyone because he cannot be tempted and does not tempt. That was in James chapter 1 verse 13. Even so, Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit of God. This confirms that it was God who had allowed this encounter. He doesn't cause the temptations, but he may allow them for a specific reason or purpose, to help us grow, to help us be challenged, to help us learn something we need to learn. In Matthew gives two warnings here. First, that we are never to assign blame to God for the temptation in our lives, which James warned us about last week. And second, we must never believe the devil can somehow act independently of God. A perfect example of that you'll find in the book of Job. When the devil came and wanted to prove Job that Job was not as faithful as, as God claimed that he was, God gave the devil free reign to do what he wanted in Job's life, but he had a leash on 
the devil. He said, you can only go so far. Do not harm his life. Do not take his life. At first, he was not to even touch Job, but he could deal with the things around him. God is in control, always. Satan can never do anything that God does not allow. Just keep that in mind as we resist the devil. Then it talks about the wilderness, which is traditionally identified with a desolate area near the city of Jericho. It was there in this remote area that the enemy, Satan, appeared to Jesus. Jesus was tempted by the devil. It calls him, in verse 3, it calls the devil the tempter. Again, the temptation was allowed by God, but not the actual, but but the actual tempting came from the accuser, the tempter, Satan. The temptation Jesus experienced never rose to the level of sin. Remember, Jesus was tempted, but he was without sin. Temptation does not equate with sin. Remember what we saw last week. When temptation meets our evil desires, that's when sin can be conceived. Jesus did not do that. Jesus was tempted, but without sin. It is only when we succumb to temptation that it becomes sin. Jesus was tempted when his flesh was at its weakest point. He had fasted for 40 days. This was after that fasting for 40 days, and his body was physically hungry. His body was physically at a weaker point. This is when Satan comes at us with, or our flesh can come against us with the temptation of the lust of the flesh. As we mentioned last week, the three types of temptation, the three types of sin in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, this one would be the lust of the flesh. The flesh was in need. The flesh was weak. The flesh was hungry. Matthew wrote that Jesus was hungry after fasting 40 days and 40 nights. He was physically hungry, as anyone would be after fasting 40 days. The devil took advantage of this time and of that hunger to initiate this temptation and the other two temptations to follow. Because remember, Jesus is still hungry, but we'll get to those other two temptations in upcoming weeks. For now, we're on the first one, the lust of the flesh, the temptation that he presented to turn the stones to bread so that he could eat. The temptations of Jesus in this encounter were all attempts to get him to use his divine privileges as the Son of God to neglect, excuse me, to the neglect of his mission as the suffering servant. In other words, to get him to uh, fail to be obedient to the Father. In other words, they were attempts to get him to circumvent the suffering he was called to take upon himself. He was being tempted to seize the crown without first enduring the cross. This passage highlights one of man's greatest temptations, to put the physical ahead of the spiritual. In other words, if Jesus were, were to succumb to this particular temptation of turning stones to bread, of course he had the power to do that, he was able to do that, but it was against what God had in mind, against God's purpose, against God's will. And therefore, if he were to go ahead and do that, it would be sin. Then continuing in verses 2 through 5. <clears throat> now, let me, let, we sort of skipped the part here. Let me go back to that first before we press on. Notice how Jesus resisted that temptation. He quoted God's word. That is always a great way to resist temptation, is to quote God's word. The psalmist said in Psalm 119.11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's a great verse to memorize right there. And even if you don't have a verse memorized, if you're being tempted, if, if the enemy's coming against you, open up God's Word and read it. But it's always good to have some memorized just so you always have it on hand. <clears throat> but Jesus used 
the verse that says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, we're going to look in the next section on where that verse actually came from, what verse Jesus was actually quoting, and and we will see the practical application of that verse. <clears throat> in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 5, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord, your God, disciplines you. <clears throat> this was an account in the book of Deuteronomy in, in the wilderness when the children of Israel had left Egypt. God had delivered them from Egypt and now they had experienced 40 years of wandering in the wilderness because of their sin. And Moses was addressing the people who remained, which most of them were at that point folks that had not been there. They weren't even alive when they left Egypt because most of those people were now dead because of, of their sin. And so some of, a lot of these were either children when they left Egypt or they had been born since that. Remember, it's 40 years later. Well, Moses explained that the, the difficult time of wandering in the wilderness for 40 years was purposeful. God had a purpose for it. God was using that time to show many important truths to the people in order to keep them faithful. The wilderness wanderings were a time of discipline that was made necessary by the sins of the people. God led them through the wilderness as a means of humbling them and testing their commitment to him. God desired to awaken the people to a new and fresh understanding of his goodness. In the desert, the Israelites were presented with two choices. They could either trust God and his provision, or they could murmur against him and spend their time complaining. In the desert, they could not produce their own food, but had to completely depend on God for food and for their very lives. God allowed them to go hungry in order to then satisfy that hunger with manna. Then Moses reminded them that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Even their food, that manna that came from heaven, was decreed by the word of God. They had manna because it came at God's command. The manna symbolized more than just the physical food the people believed they desperately needed. It represented the actual word of God. Ultimately, then, it was not the bread that kept them alive, but it was the word of God. Food acquired any other way apart from God's word, would have been insufficient to sustain them in that wilderness experience. This is the verse, verse 3 of Deuteronomy 8, that Jesus quoted in Matthew chapter 4, when he was tempted by Satan to turn stones into bread. The lesson is this. Spiritual food is much more important than physical food. Not only did God provide manna, but he miraculously preserved the people's clothing and preserved their health as they walked for 40 years in that desert. Moses said, your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell, which was a testimony of God's faithfulness. Moses described this time as one of discipline, as a father does to a child. Remember, they would have gone from Egypt to the promised land in a very short time. But because of their sin and their rebellion against God, he calls them to then wander in the wilderness for 40 years. As he said here, it was a time of testing 
to prove if they would keep his commands. It was a time to humble them. It was a time of testing. <clears throat> Moses described this time as discipline. The discipline referred to in this context was more of an educational experience. God wanted them to learn. He wanted to teach them. The God who loved them and provided for them in miraculous ways, even when they were so undeserving and unfaithful, was certainly a God who could be trusted in all areas of their lives. <clears throat> and then continuing with Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 6 through 10, <clears throat> excuse me, Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. <clears throat> Moses urged them to observe the commands of the Lord your God. First, they were to walk in his ways, to be absolutely obedient to his statutes and commandments, and to live their lives in faithful submission just as we are to do. Second, they were to fear him or to revere him. They were to be reverently afraid to disobey one so powerful and holy. You and I should do the same thing. Revere him, fear him in the sense of being afraid to disobey, but knowing he loves us and will forgive and serving him obediently out of love for him. In the past, the Israelites had nothing. They were dependent on God for everything. Now, as they prepared to enter into the fluence of Canaan, a land full of sustenance and bountiful blessings, the temptation would be to forget the one who brought them and instead rely on themselves once again. The requirement for full obedience on the Lord would not be set aside when their lives got better. Once they got into that land and had everything they could imagine, he's saying that the temptation would be to forget about God, forget about trusting him. Why do we need him? We have everything here we need. But don't forget where that came from and who can take it away. As a matter of fact, <laughs> Moses cautioned the Israelites to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. The blessings of Canaan would provide years of comfort to the Israelites, but it could also steer them away from the Lord and into a false sense of complacency and self-sufficiency. The blessings of Canaan would serve as a visual and physical manifestation of the special privilege they had, they had being in a covenant relationship with God. When you and I take time to meditate on all the good that God has done for us, it should draw that same response. We should be in awe of him and praise him for his goodness, his blessings. We must take time daily to meditate on the goodness of God. And we must recognize that all the blessings we experience have come from his hand a matter of fact, that was the verse from last week as well, if you recall. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of the heavenly lights. Every blessing we have, God has given us. Let's give him praise and glory and honor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, wonderful, precious Lord, our God, thank you so much that you're our provider, our sustainer, our redeemer, that every good and perfect gift comes from you. Everything we have has come from you. Lord, you have provided for our every need at every turn. And, and Lord, help us to not forget that. Help us to never forget to praise you. Help us, Lord, to walk in obedience, to submission to you, Lord. Help us to love you with all that we are, with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Help us to honor you and glorify you in all that we do. 
And Lord, help us to lead others to you so that they can know you and be saved as well. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I will see you next time.